Today is Friday, August 4th, 1989. My name is Ray and I'm an alcoholic. I invite you to listen to the 6th Shenandoah Valley Roundup of Alcoholics Anonymous at Orkney Springs, Virginia. The speaker tonight is Jim Pohl from Canada. I didn't get sober to get serious. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Mike. I'm a member of the East End Group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Kitchener, Ontario. 60 miles west of Toronto, I don't know, 10 hours from here, if you drive fast. Our speaker tonight is a fellow that I met, I think, in 81, Jim? 80, yeah, when he moved to Kitchener, 81. And right off the bat, I didn't like him. He was arrogant, cocky, pain in the ass, just like me. And uh, since 81, uh, We've grown real close, and he isn't arrogant and cocky anymore. And I think maybe he, I hope I, I reflect some of that back on myself. We're good, good pals today, and we, we're in contact uh, with each other a lot. And I want you guys to know that he's a hard nose. And uh, he doesn't mind telling you how it works. And uh, he's going to tell you how it works. And uh, Jim speaks the truth. And uh, anyway, without anything more from me, I'd ask you folks if you'd welcome my good friend Jim O from Waterloo, Ontario. <laughs> I'm an alcoholic, and my name is Jim O'Rourke. Hi, everybody. Boy, is it ever nice to be in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I really thank you all for being here tonight. I sometimes think that, uh, that I would rather that somebody else did this than me, but I'm like the 11 alcoholics that it takes to screw a light bulb in the ceiling. It takes one to put it in and 10 to share the experience. <laughs> Tonight I'd like to uh, share the experience with you, a little bit about uh, what happened, what it was like, what happened, uh, what happened to me. I gave myself a set of instructions tonight, and the first set of instructions was, take a deep breath. Excuse me. My gratefulness starts a way, way back when, and I'd like to thank Bill Wilson for going to Akron, Ohio and finding a telephone. I would like to thank Dr. Bob Smith for being on the other end of that line when the telephone call was placed. I would like to thank Greg O'Rourke for carrying the message to a guy in Chatham, Ontario and allowed to get sober February the 4th, 1980. Had uh, that fellow been still alive today, he would have had 25 years sobriety April the 15th of this year. That was my dad. And I'd also like to thank you people for being here and being a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. And a very special thanks to the family of, and if he can hear us, Henry T. I just, I just in my mind, just kind of half see Henry around the, the, uh, the Horn of Plenty table last year. And uh, he always seemed to have been busy. And you people, in your hearts, will never forget him. I'm the type of a person that when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous that for the first while I was kind of window shopping, you know, just kind of having to look around and uh, I knew I had to be there, but I kind of I window shopped to a point where I wanted to find out why you peop all you people didn't live under bridges or in boxcars, or you didn't all live on Skid Row in big cities. And after that identification, and then I saw there were people from all walks of life there was husbands and wives, there was professional people, there were doctors and lawyers, there were mothers and there were aunts and uncles, and there were children, there were students, all walking around Alcoholics Anonymous living one day at a time. And after a period of identification, I finally can come to realize that I can stay firm in my convictions as they've been taught to me and proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that I can live free of alcohol, one day at a time, and never have to go back to the horrors of yesterday, providing that I'm willing to pay a price each and every day of my life. And you've taught me that. 
You've taken your time, you've written books, you've stood up in front of meetings, you've sat at tables, and you've shared that with me. And you showed me how I can live one day at a time, how I can live free of alcohol, how I can live with myself and with the people around me, and how I can live with the promise that you tell me about in the big book and in all, in all our literature. And all those promises on page 83 and 84 where it says, at the bottom of page 83, that if we're painstaking about this phase of our development, then certain things will happen to us. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous on February the 7th, 1980, three days after I had had my last drink. And before I say any more, there's ugly at the back door. <laughs> Thanks for making it, Paul. I just love what it says here, the language of the heart. I would have never ever known what that was had I not come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I wouldn't know what it would be, what it promised me to be able to see, do, and feel the things I could not see, do, or feel before. And that's the language of the heart. I had all kinds of things to say when I come up here. Been, you know, we have three talks, you know, the one you rehearse before, the one you give, and the one you rehearse afterwards. <laughs> and there's a couple of things that keep running through my head. One that a friend of mine told me once, he says, Jimmy, he said, just say what you have to say, because what's going to happen is when you're all done saying what you're going to say, God's going to shut you off anyway. My wife said something to me. She said, Jim, just tell those people exactly who you are. And that's what I plan on doing. I'd like to just explain to you a little bit for identification purposes what kind of a drinker I was. I didn't drink because I liked it. I drank for effect. I eventually started to like the odd little bit. I liked, used to like what it, what it did to me inside, how I felt inside, how it would allow me to rise above all those other insecure feelings that I had and all the fears and terrors and of bewilderment that Mike talked about and that talks about in, in our literature in our big book. I drank because I was an emotional cripple and being an emotional cripple meant that the things that I was afraid of, and I'm not, I, I'll kind of expand a little bit on the word fear with me. I heard a guy say once it was false events appearing real and I can make a false event appear real. I could talk, talk to people and tell people in a bar or any place, didn't really matter. Because alcoholism was a part of my daily life. It wasn't just when I drank, point of clarification. I could tell these people how good I was, how terrific I was, the things I had done for people, the accomplishments that I had made, my bank balance, my wonderful family and how good I w what was to my children and to my wife, how great of a son I was to Greg and Olga O'Rourke, how terrific of a brother I was to Tim, Dan, and Colleen. How great and wonderful employee I was. And I had to tell people that. Because I knew down deep inside that it was a blatant lie. And I didn't feel those, all those wonderful things that I told all those people. And I would think afterwards, I would say, Jim, why did you say those things? Why did you do those things? The emotional cripple carried on to other areas of my life, too. I was afraid of rejection. I was afraid of what people might think of me. I remember sitting on a porch on Samuel Street in Kitchener about seven years ago, and there was about four or five pe of us people sitting on that porch. And they were talking about something, and, and one of the beginners and the newcomers at the time had mentioned something about something, and Terry had said, it goes back to fear. What are you talking about fear? What are we talking about when we talk about fear? We're talking about being afraid. I try not to use those words and just pop it out at you and say, well, now you've got to go home and pick up the dictionary and you've got to read about it or you've got to experience it in the next 20 meetings. The fear for Jim was that I was afraid that I was going to get caught not being the person that I thought or I tried to project to you to all these people out there. That's what I was afraid of. And I'd manufacture those things. I manufactured those things with my wife, my mother and my dad, my brothers, my sisters, my friends, my working companions, colleagues, and the people I sat in bars with. And I was manufacturing something that I didn't know what it was. I needed everybody's approval. Another fear. And I would tell them something. For example, I would say, 
I just bought a new business, and I didn't. I just bought a new business. I've had it for about three months now, and I manufacture this business. And the business was going terrific. All this money in the bank, my God, after three months, I got $10,000 in the bank. My car outside, nice new car, and I wasn't a new car. If you don't believe me, just take a look at my clothes. Look at me. I didn't dress in pink then. Mike did all, I think. <laughs> Those are one of the places that, or some, several of the places that alcohol took me. Like Mike, I started to drink when I was 18. When I picked up a drink, the drink took me, and it, I'll tell you, right from the very first one, it took me. And I didn't realize what it was really, really doing. I didn't realize the effect it was having, and I didn't realize the monster it was creating. It created a self-centered, egotistical, no good son of a pup. It created a person who had both the feet planted in midair. It created a thing that reminds me, it kind of reminds me of a little story about a little boy that's nine years old. And this was me. And that little boy was up just on his way to bed one night and he'd close his door behind him. And he knelt down beside his bed and he put his head into his hands very fervently and he says, God, thank you for the nice day. Thank you for this and thank you for that. But he said, God, he said, I would really, really like, like it if you would give me a new car. And he leaped to his feet and he ran to the window and he looked down in the driveway and there was no new car. And he goes back to his bed disappointed and he put his head back in his hands and very fervently and reverently this time, with all the enthusiasm he could muster, he said, God, please, God, God, please, please, God, please give me a new car. Left to his feet, went back to the window, looked down in the driveway, and there again there was no new car. Upset, disturbed, he ran downstairs to his mother and dad's bedroom. And he goes into the corner of the bedroom on the little nightstand and there's a, a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he grabs the statue and he goes into the kitchen and he gets a newspaper and string and elastic bands and tape all out of the cupboard. And he runs back up to his bedroom and he wraps his statue in paper and taped it and more paper and tape and band, or elastic bands. And he gets it in a parcel about this big and about this clumpy. And he goes into his closet and he pulls a box out of his closet and he takes the statue and he puts it in the box folds the lids over and tapes it up, wraps it with paper, he puts it back underneath all his hockey equipment and, and all the crap in his closet, and he goes back to his bed and he said, God, if you ever want to see your mother again. <laughs> There's absolutely no reason for me to go th through a blow-by-blow -blow description of the type of drinker that I was, how I drank, where I drank, it was all the same. We drank probably in the same places under the same lights. I drank in the fast lane. Um, I liked to be out where it was all happening. I was not a closet drinker. I didn't sit in the corner of my basement or underneath the stairs in the, in the wine cellar, sipping on wine through a straw or hiding in a closet. I had to be out there where all the activity was. And when, I, when you're out there where all the activity is, it presents a lot of times a different set of problems. The most important thing is, is as a result of my drinking and the effects of alcoholism in my life, I arrived at the same place as you did. And that's the important thing. I'll share something else with you too. I don't think anybody ever got to Alcoholics Anonymous for the wrong reason. I think if you stay in Alcoholics Anonymous and you got here, whatever in the hell the reason was, that's the important reason. So it doesn't matter. Stay. I got here because my wife caught me being an alcoholic. That's exactly what happened. I'll share something else with you too. I'm very thankful for a couple of days in my life. One is April the 10th, 1981. The other one's May 23rd, 1985. Those two specified dates are the two days that I did my fifth step, the first and the second time. For those that haven't done their fourth step and fifth step, it may, mean, it may not mean much to you, or not as much as it does to me or the ones that have done it. But going back to that day in February the 4th, 1980, sitting out behind the L&M meat market on uh, Tecumseh Road, the corner of Tecumseh and Lowe's on Road in Windsor, in the car about 9.30 at night, and my wife is sitting on the passenger side and I know that I'm hung and I know that I got to do something about this drinking and I know that everything that was leading up to and including 
the night before was all coming out. And those two specified dates relieved me and can do the same for you from the bondage of self, the horrors of my past, the degradation, the remorses, the guilts, and all those horrible rotten things that motivated me to the, to, to the depths and the bowels of alcoholism. And today, as a result of that, have been able to live with my past, to forgive myself, and the language of the heart is to be able to classify that as an asset. And I never ever thought that that would ever happen to this alcoholic, ever in my entire life that I would think for one minute that the horrors of my past would be helpful to somebody else. During those days of drinking, the irresponsibilities, I was a very irresponsible person. I was, I, I run and hide from everything. And just an example of that was, if I own, owed a bill for $100, and I had to pay that bill on Wednesday, and I had $98 in my pocket, and it was Tuesday, and I knew I was going to the bar that night, it was no contest as to where most of that money was going to end up. And it wasn't going to be to the people I owed it to on Wednesday. Because you see, when I'm $2 short anywhere at that time, it was too embarrassing. My pride would get in the way and I just couldn't go and pay a bill and tell those people that I didn't have enough. So rather than do that, I'd go and spend it. And I'd say to myself, I'll make it up next week. I'm getting paid Friday. And everything will be okay. I'll go out and I'll take care. i go out and have a good time tonight. They got all the money in the world. My 98 or or $100 isn't going to mean a damn to them anyway. And I'd jump in my car and I'd head out to the bar. So therefore, there was a, lot of, there was a lack of direction, irresponsibility. And those are some of the things that I've had to deal with since I've come into the program. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous for the second time, I came when I was 22 years old. Obviously, there was a problem in my life because you just don't show up here because you want it, because it was a, an in thing to do. Or you were sitting beside the television one night and you, you know, the wife is there and, and she loves you dearly, you know that story, and, and all the kids are crowded around your feet. And the dog has just fetched the newspaper from the curb and brought it in for you and all your bills are paid. And the mortgage, you had a burning of the mortgage ceremony six months ago and, and you're, you know, just glowing with love and exuberance and, and all those wonderful things and, and, and decide to show up in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. In a very short, very short sentence, I came here, Jack, because the heat was on. That's the only, way I, the only reason I came here, because the heat was on. And it was on when I was 22 years old, and it was on from thereafter. 22 years old is about 17 years, I guess. 15 years. I had a 15-year slip. I'm sure happy that a whole lot of people laugh at that because I don't believe in the word slip. I believe in the word premeditated drunk. And that's what I had from the age 22 to age 37. I had a premeditated drunk. I didn't like what I saw when I came here. I, got, I came here because I had to come here because the, the heat was on and there weren't any major threats. If we could take blackboards and put them all around this room and I could take my life history and all the things that had happened to me as a direct result of alcoholism, not just drinking, but alcoholism. And if I put all the series of events and the feelings and the horrors and the activities in my life and put them all up on those blackboards, and I said to you folks, I said, now let's read, let's take about three hours and read all this stuff, and I'll go over this in a blow-by-blow -blow description. Let me tell you what the sad thing would be. The sad thing would be there would be somebody sitting in this audience tonight that would say, that will never happen to me. That's a sad thing. And that very person or persons are the very people that are looking for a way out of this thing, baby, not a way in. It's time to look for a way in. Becoming a part of Alcoholics Anonymous, becoming a part of the fellowship, and learning to understand exactly what it says behind me, the language of the heart. Look for a way in. Don't be that person that's going to say that will never happen to me. It's where they, when, they, when they refer to, to identification, do not compare. Just identify with what is being said. What happened to me since I came to Alcoholics Anonymous would take a long time. And Mike said, if I only got three and a half hours, I saw some things when I first came. I didn't always see people, I didn't see everybody with smile on their, smiles on their faces. I didn't see a lot of happiness because I couldn't see happiness from inside this burnt, tore up, beat up inside of a human being. 
I saw things like a little short guy about five feet tall, arrogant, self-centered, smart aleck, well-dressed, vibrant, shaking people's hands. And that was a, something I really didn't want to do. I didn't want to shake anybody's hand. I didn't want to be really, I didn't know how to be a part of it, yet I kind of wanted to be a part of it. The first meeting I went to for the second time was the Friendly Riverside Group in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And that little short five foot guy was the guy that they talked about in my life when they talk about in our literature that we reach a turning point. And I was that kid when I first came in that, uh, that suffered from self-centeredness and suffered from all the fears of rejection and anxieties and, and all the, the, four, the headless, four headless horsemen, uh, the bad feelings, the lack of understanding, the absence of love and all those things. And this guy was the type of a guy that had the ability to put me all up on a wall, take me apart, put me all up on a wall and allow me to look at myself. A lot of us have the ability to do that. Sometimes it's called character assassination. Sometimes it's called ridicule. Some, sometimes it's, uh, uh, or most of the times it's unhealthy. The neat part of it was that he subtly and lovingly didn't use the ridicule. He just put me up there and let me look at myself and allowed me to take a look at how alcoholism had tore me down and tore him down. And he did that for a couple of hours. And at the end of the two hours, he had an extreme ability that is necessary that if people do that, as he put me all back together again in such a fashion that when I left his home, we've heard that word hope around here several times. And he gave me the hope that I needed to live one day at a time in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. He also set me on a, on a path where I started to look at things that people told me to do. They, started to, they told me to get a sponsor, join a group, and did it, did it, did it. And please don't take that for granted. That is something that is necessary. It was very necessary with me. I joined the group. I got a sponsor. And after four months in the program, regretfully, I finally told my dad. And that was a terrible thing for me to do. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Because he had found out secondhand that I was in the program. He lived in Chatham. I lived in Windsor. So I went and visited him and I told him, I finally told him I was in a, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and I joined a group in Windsor called the Friendly Riverside Group. And, uh, and him and I sat there in his trailer at an AA, con or at an AA uh, camp out and both of us cried. And the reason I didn't tell him is because I thought the, the self my self-centeredness was, my attitude was that I didn't want him camped on my doorstep. I didn't want him telling me, oh, Jimmy, easy does it, you know, like, uh, come on, Jimmy, you got to go to 20 meetings a week, and uh, you got to do what I do, and you got to do this, and you... I didn't want that. I felt terrible about that afterwards, but that's, that's not what I wanted. You people laid out some things for me. You told me some things I had picked up on. You first said that we of Alcoholics Anonymous are 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. How we recovered from that state of hopelessness was the reason the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous was read, or was, pardon me, was written. They told me that it was their textbook. They told me that if I became a student of the textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous, that I could live free of alcohol and the delusions of alcoholism one day at a time for the rest of my life. And they guaranteed me that. Some people would say, uh-oh. The next thing this guy's going to tell you, stand up there, that he's going to stay sober the rest of his life. I didn't say that. Nor would I say that. But I will tell you one thing, that if I do tomorrow what I did today and what, I'm, what I did yesterday, I'm going to stay sober tomorrow. That's a guarantee. And as a result of that guarantee, I will be able to become part of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and become a member of it. And I will be able to become part of what you people talk about is the language of the heart. As Mike was saying, I moved to Waterloo, which is 60 miles west of Toronto, 10 hours and 10 minutes from here. And that's about 10 minutes away from Mike's house, and about 10 minutes away from the group that Mike belongs to, and to a little group called the West Town Group in Waterloo. And my sponsor and I, in 1981, started that group. And we're really happy to see that there's a lot of growth as a result of about eight and a half years of of activity in that group. And it's, it's a wonderful thing 
is to be a part of starting a group of Alcoholics Anonymous. I wouldn't recommend that 200 people run out of here today and start up groups right away because it wouldn't, uh, that, that just doesn't work all that great. But there's a lot of rewards being a, a major part of a group or a minor part of a group. The West Town Group of Alcoholics Anonymous has a membership of 30 and we have an attendance of about 40 people on every Tuesday night. And we have a closed discussion meeting and the type of group it is that we break up into about five or six tables depending on how many people are in the group. And if we, can, if we count 40 people, then we divide the 40 by six. And that's about just a little under seven per table and we all sit around in a, in a close little knit. And we kind of share a little bit about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like with us at the time. And it allows us to be able to discuss with our friends and other members of Alcoholics Anonymous exactly how we feel inside. When I was at a meeting, I, I, just before my first birthday, and I used this, this little ten two-letter word phrase quite freely at the group I belonged to, and it goes like this, if it is to be, it is up to me. I hope you remember that. If it is to be, it is up to me. I put that on my medallion as I heard it from a fellow I respected a lot in AA. And I try to use that as part of the program that I have used or, or copied from the big book. So when I become a student of the text of the big book, I found out some different things. After talking a little bit about the West Ham group, I just wanted to get a plug in for them. Now it's going to talk a little bit more about Jim and how, what Jim did inside and what he's learned. I've gone through a lot of emotional pain to arrive where I'm at today. And that's nothing, uh, that's just a real quick phrase from me to you. The emotional pain is a lot of things. It's, it was changing a lot of things inside that had to be changed inside. And there's an awful lot more to do. The people where I come from are people that are sometimes I think shooting arrows at me, you know, the arrows of pain that, that, that make me change, make me feel different. They'll say things like, um, I've got a 12-step call, mate, will you go with me? And I don't want to go. And I'm saying inside myself, I really don't want to go. Why would I go on this 12-step call? But I go. And the change for me inside is I would not do that before. Some of the other things that, um, uh, for getting sober and changing the things inside of Jim is learning to deal with my fears, my lack of understanding of the word and the, and the definition of the word. I, uh, one of the greatest fears that I had was the inability to allow somebody else to do something nice for Jim. Have you ever been in a situation where Somebody has said, uh, or come up to you like your boss or somebody that you don't really know that well and say, let's, let's go for lunch. My first reaction would be to say no. That would be the first thing I would do, say no. Something I've had to change in me is to say yes. When somebody wants to do something nice for me, I have to learn to say yes. It allows somebody else the experience of doing something nice for somebody else. If I say no, I'm depriving them of that. That was a neat thing that I learned. One of the other things that I was taught to do was, or that I had to change inside, was my fear of rejection. I had to be very open to that. I'd be very open to my feelings. And the fear of rejection to me would be that if I said something, I would wait, wait for your reaction to it. And if I saw you didn't react to it too well or you criticized me for it, my guts would tie up in knots inside. And I'd, I'd clam up and I wouldn't say anything anymore. If I'd say something to my wife, for example, uh, whatever, it doesn't matter anyway, and, sh and she would be critical of it, or I guess they call it now critique it, I'd be afraid to say it again. I wouldn't share it again. I've been taught at AA meetings that if I want, if I want relief and more understanding about how I feel inside and how to shed those fears, then I have to learn to share them. And I also was taught that a problem shared is one half solved. Was that ever a nice thing to learn? So please don't be afraid of sharing a problem or sharing a good thing that happened to you. 
I had to find out about rigorous honesty, where it says in the big book how it works, the how part, the honesty, the open-mindedness, and the willingness. The rigorous honesty for me was to learn to deal with the fears, the rejection, the remorse, and the guilt. And the only way I could deal with those was to filter them through the 12 steps and also to share them with you people. I think one of the, one of the other important things in sobriety that I've learned is learn to find some sort of balance in my life. It was very difficult for Jim to find any type of balance if, without any type of direction. I had, didn't have any direction. I didn't know which way I was going, where I was going. So therefore, I couldn't find any balance. Once I arrived at the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, then I found there was some sort of direction. There was some way out of this dilemma. The direction that I found was that if I could take the 12 steps and start running them through my own system, one at a time, one to 12, then I would find some sort of direction. I would be able to deal with the fears and the lack of understanding, the inability to love and be loved. The first step I had to deal with was, of course, the first step. And I'm not going to go through the steps, but that was a mer that's the only step that we have to do to 100% perfection. The only step. All the rest of them, we just have to make a, take a whack at them, you know, like run through them, do them one at a time. They also told me something else very important about the steps. Is Jim, do it and then understand it. Don't do it like we're supposed to do, you know, like we think we should do them. It's by trying to spend a lot of time trying to understand it and then doing it. Do it and then understand it. So if I pick up the big book, and if I read a little bit, by the way, if you don't want to learn how to get sober, for God's sakes, don't pick that book up. Don't ever pick, don't, I don't know what they cost down here, but up in Canada they cost 88 cents. Sorry, five dollars. But if you don't want to learn how to get sober, don't buy the book. Don't buy the 12 and 12, don't buy any of those books at all. But if you want to learn how to get sober, buy the big book. Because in the forward to the first edition, it talks about we of Alcoholics Anonymous. Our 100 men and women. Isn't that nice? That's really nice. It made me the promises. It gave me 12 suggested steps that became mandatory in Jim's life that I had to practice to the best of my ability and do to the best of my ability. When I started to read the big book, there were other things that I saw and other things that I felt and other things I became to understand. It told me that how it worked was the rigorous honesty, the honesty about getting honest with Jim, as I mentioned before. The open-mindedness was, was to start to practice the principles in all of my affairs. The open-mindedness was, was to let you be who you were and not me to be the critical of what you are. In other words, Jim, get rid of the personality problem that you have with other people. The ability to criticize, the ability to be judgmental of other people. We have a speaker that was on, on one of the circuits once and he says, we're going to kill people in Alcoholics Anonymous by being judgmental and using character assassination. We have to stop. We can't do that. The first thing, if I start criticizing somebody else or being judgmental about their character defect, does that mean that I'm exempted from character defects? I don't think so. I don't think so. I have to do the very best. If it's a, if it's a major situation, then I have to do the very best to forgive the person that has hurt me or injured me. Words are words. Acts are acts. I have character defects. The character defects that, that blossomed in my drinking and then a lot of times have blossomed in my sobriety have not become the discretion of somebody else because a lot of people haven't seen it. But if I opened up to everybody and showed you all my character defects, then I could become susceptible to your criticism. And I really don't want to do that. There are some people in AA that I can be very open with. I sat and talked to Mike. I sat and talked to Kelly, Gary, Fred, Larry, John, Roger, Susan, Terry, Gary. I can tell those people my insides and tell those people who I am, what I am, and what I'm made of it. And the things that bother me, and the things that hurt me, and the things that make me feel bad inside the things that drive me down into the depths of my own hell, and all they say is, Jim, here's what maybe you should do, or here's what maybe you should look at. Seven some odd years ago, I was sitting on Susan's porch. We were talking one day, <clears throat> there was about four or five of us there. Somehow or other, the topic came up, and I, 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 I said, I'm not sure about this love thing. I really don't know what we're talking about when we're talking about love. I, I don't know what it really means. 
You know how you associate love, you know, when you're sick as I was, was the back seat of a 57 Chevy, the drive-in movie. I really wanted to know what it felt like. I saw what some of you people had. I saw what she had. I saw what Terry had. I saw what Mike had. And I saw that there was some love there. But I didn't know exactly how it felt. I wanted to love my family. I wanted to love my wife. I wanted to love my mom and dad more than I did. I wanted to be open to it. Susan said, here, here's a book. Try this book. Read it. And I read it, and it was titled Love. It told me how I can love my fellow man. It told me how I can love my wife. It told me how I can love my children. It told me how I can love you people. It told me how I can be open to somebody else's love. The easiest thing for Jim to do is do something good for somebody else. The hardest thing for Jim to do is to accept something from somebody else. To accept somebody else's love. I found that loving my wife and loving my kids and loving my mother and loving my brother and my sister and loving my grandchildren sometimes is painful. Sometimes love is just not carrying somebody. Carrying as in lifting, as in holding their emotions up. For me to, to love somebody is to be there. I found something, that, something out with my, with my children. That loving my kids is not being a lecturer. Loving my kids is sitting back and allowing them to go through the things they have to go through even though it damn near kills me. For me to love you people is to see a suffering alcoholic come in the door of Alcoholics Anonymous, sit down in a chair, dying inside, feeling all the remorses and the guilts and the hurts and the angers and the I can't quits and I wished I could and God help me please. I don't want to be this way anymore. I don't want to feel this anymore. And to love and feel a compassion for that sick, suffering alcoholic, that sick human being. And to be able to go up to that person and put my hand out and say, welcome. See, when we say welcome to each other and to the suffering alcoholic walking into Alcoholics Anonymous, we're saying we love you. For me to say that and for that to happen to me is that's, what I, that's how I treat it. Is when you put your hand out to me, you're saying welcome, I love you. I love you for what you are. I love you for who you are, and we'd love to have you here. And I have no trouble coming to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. It's not difficult to walk in the door when you feel that way and you've identified or, identified or interpreted that way. There was days when I couldn't crawl into bed at night after being in the bowels of Detroit, practicing my alcoholism and not being able to put my arm around my wife and, and feeling the, the horrors and the dirt <coughs> of alcoholism the degradation, that I wanted to put my arm around her and just say I'm sorry and I couldn't say it. And I'd hear that little whimper and that cry, that little cry inside, and I swear to God today that I can still hear that as if, as if it was yesterday, and I'm sure that was 10 years ago. And the love that I've tried to generate now is a helpful type, is to be there, to be a part of it, to be a part of anything that is going to help you and help me. So I've learned this thing, this little, <coughs> excuse me, this little bit about love. You've taught me. You've shared some things with me at meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous that tells me that you love me. And I accept that. Come down, <coughs> excuse me, from Canada to this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful part of the country and to feel some things inside I've never felt before. To be able to be asked to come up here and to share some things with you people that I've never shared before. To share a part of me. And for you people to share this whole weekend the good feelings and the love that you have for everybody in this room. And every, every angle and every direction that you've learned to love and to feel and to understand anything that you've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is going to be shared here this weekend. And we're all going to be a part of that. I never felt that way before. I've never understood that way of living, that way of feeling before. I didn't know what it meant. It was just a matter of fact. Well, that's the way it is. Since I've, we've, since I've come into Alcoholics Anonymous, things have, been, have improved at home in the last, well, the last four or five years. It hasn't been easy. It isn't always glorious to be able to come into AA and everything's going to be tickety-boo and great and, uh, you know, the, the, somebody's going to drop the big book into your lap and you're going to be walk off into the tulips. As sure as hell didn't happen to me. The first four and a half, five years in sobriety, 
were not the greatest. I'm sitting on my couch in 1970, or 1985 in the living room of my house in, in Waterloo. The marriage is coming apart. The relationship I have with two of my kids is coming apart. There's a lot of hate there. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of unsurety. There's a lot of fears, a lot of anxieties. My inability to get out there because of my, to get out and work because of my insecurities, because of my low self-esteem of myself, the inability to be able to make a living. And I'm sitting on this couch and the only thing I'm doing right is going to AA meetings. The only thing I'm doing right is being a part of that Alcoholics Anonymous. The only thing I'm doing right is doing what you people tell me to do. And you kept telling me it was going to be okay. And I said, yeah, right. And I don't feel good about this. And if somebody had handed me a 357 Magnum, I'd have swear to God, I'd have put it to my head and pulled the trigger. That's how bad I felt. I didn't want to live like this anymore. I didn't want to go through that anymore. You people kept telling me if I kept doing what I was told to do, I'd come out the front of the end of the pipe okay. And God help me, I didn't want to. Thank God for people in my life, my sponsor, Ron, and all the people that were members, members of the West Ham group and every other group in Kitchener, people like Mike, people like Terry and Sue, people like Jack, people like God, allowed me to go through this stuff one day at a time. Allow me to come up the other end of the pipe and have a better understanding of life, better understanding of people's feelings, people's understanding. It says on page 99 in the 12 and 12, it says, learn to understand instead of being understood, and I tried to do that. Learn to love instead of be loved, and I tried to do that, and I kept practicing it and working on it and doing all those things I was supposed to do with it. And eventually the dust started to clear. Eventually I started to feel, see, do, and feel the things that I could not see, do, or feel before. Eventually I started to feel somewhat comfortable with myself. No longer was I afraid to be alone. No longer was I afraid of what people thought of me. No longer was I afraid of fear itself. And as I kept practicing and kept doing, keep on doing these steps, the more and more my emotions stabilized, my ability to love increased, my ability to understand increased. I started to see things clearly. I started to feel the language of the heart. I started to feel good and comfortable inside a gym. There's people around me that felt comfortable. And I didn't get it by sitting around <coughs> meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous waiting to catch something. Because I don't believe that you can go to an AA meeting and catch anything except a lot of words. I believe myself that if I work and work hard at it in the, very, in the early days, eventually I can get myself going into a program that I can take out of the big book of AA and put some sort of practice in my life and live free and comfortable and have a lot of joy. And by God, I'll tell you, I've experienced some of that stuff. I'll tell you one, thing's that one of the things I've enjoyed is the closeness that you people have allowed me to be to you. That people put their arm around me and hug me and tell me they love me. And for somebody to put their arms around me and say, I pray for you. Man, that stuff I could never understand. And to know what they meant by that. And for another man to hug me and tell me he loves me, I think that's phenomenal. I think it's great for the other guy. We have four grandchildren. We have a little girl by the name of Janie. And Janie is going to be four years old tomorrow. And I want to say happy birthday to Janie. She's a little blonde kid about this high. And I love her. And she loves her papa. And I love her mother. And I love her sister. And I love my two boys. And I love my mom. And I love my dad. And I love my two brothers. And I love my sister. And I love everything that has to do with Alcoholics Anonymous because without it, I wouldn't be able to love anything, including you people. I wouldn't be able to accept love from any one of you or be a part of you. Textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous says this. It says our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man or woman who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. 
but obviously you cannot transmit something you don't have. See to it your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is a great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of the past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thank you.